Alrighty. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to have you all with us. I'm just giving it one more minute. I guess we'll start at 6.05. Give people a chance to get in and get settled for this amazing conversation that is about to begin. Alan, I'm so happy to support this book and the work that you're doing, the Thanks. abolitionist work. Thanks. I'm very excited to be here and very grateful to you and JMEC for Families for hosting me. Really looking forward to this. All right, so everyone, we're gonna get started. And what I'm gonna do first is start with thanking my staff for helping me to set this up and getting this webinar together and all of the logistics and everything that they planned. So thank each of you for joining. My name is Joyce McMillan and I am the executive director of JMAC for Families. I am also a parent who has been impacted by the family policing system. I'm so thrilled to be here today for the official launch of Alan's new book, Confronting the Racist Legacy of the American Child Welfare System, The Case for Abolition. Today, Alan and I will discuss the book and explore the history of family policing, the dangers of reformist reforms, and the movement for abolition. Before we get into the conversation, I have just a few logistical details to share with you, and then we'll be moving straight into the conversation. Please use the question and answer feature, the Q&A, to ask questions during the webinar. We will circle back to the questions at the end of the event. You're welcome to use the chat feature to share comments too, but we will be looking to the Q&A box for questions that you'd like to have answered at the end. Closed captions are available. To turn them on, please select show captions at the bottom of your screen. And now, because I don't believe that anyone can introduce Alan the way that he can introduce himself, I'm gonna allow Alan to introduce himself. Alan, welcome. Thanks, Joyce. Again, I really appreciate um, you and your staff and JMEC for Families organizing this. Um, I'm a, my name's Ellen Detloff. I'm a professor of social work, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Up In Movement, which is an abolitionist movement that works in collaboration with JMEC for Families, many other organizations toward abolition of the family policing system. I came into this work because I uh, began my career as a social worker working in the child welfare system or what we call the family policing system and um, learned firsthand about the harms that the system causes to mostly black children and families. And I spent many years um, after I left the system doing research about the system and the role of racism within the system and many years doing reformist type work that I think a lot of us did for a while, but ultimately came to the decision that those reforms um, will will never work and are designed to fail, as I talk about in the book, um, and then worked with several colleagues to begin the Up In movement, and um, that's when we met, and I'm very excited to be part of this conversation tonight. Thank you, Alan. So let's just jump right into it. Mm -hmm. This part really frames it for me. The parallels that your book draws. Your book draws clear parallels between the separation of families during slavery and the child welfare system as it was called before families with lived expertise began advocating to abolish it. Why was it important to base the premise of the book, including the cover image of the book on this connection to the family separations that were done during slavery? Yeah, I, the, it's such an important thing to make those connections because those connections aren't discussed enough. And those parallels between the separations that were done during chattel slavery and the separations that are done now by the family policing system are incredibly clear. Um, for anyone who wants to understand the system, it's important to understand um, that the family separations done today 
are not the first usage of family separations by the government for the purpose of maintaining the oppression of Black people. And in fact, there's been other times in our history, things like the Japanese internment camps, Indian boarding schools, where family separations have been used to oppress other populations as well. But the original use of family separation in the United States goes back to the time of chattel slavery for the purpose of maintaining the control over Black families. Um, and it's important to understand that the purpose is the same. It's not just that the same tactic was used, but the purpose was the same. During slavery, family separations were used to compel the compliance, obedience of Black families and to prevent any kind of uprising or rebellion. And that fear of family separation is the same fear that's used today to maintain the oppression of black children and families. So the purpose of the separations is the same. What's also important though, is that during the time of slavery, it was actually those separations and the pain and trauma caused by those separations that led to many white Northern people joining the abolitionist movement. And that's why the picture on the cover of the book is a picture from Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe and was really one of the catalysts of the abolition movement because that book was so popular. There's even an anecdote that says that when Harriet, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said to her, so you're the little lady who's responsible for starting this war. That book and her depictions of family separations were so impactful. So that's that's why it's important to make those connections. Wow, thank you for that. Um, I'm really happy to see how you drew all of the connections, just not the connections for slavery, right? Because we know that Black people are most impacted by this system, but I don't want to get stuck there because the importance is for people to understand any injustice to anyone is a threat of injustice to everyone. So injustice spreads like a cancer. Absolutely. So do you want to share a little bit about why in the title of your book and the introduction, you use the term child welfare system, but then you make it clear throughout the remainder of the book that you're referring to the child welfare system as the family policing system. Where does that term come from and why do you use it in your book? Yeah, I think it's really important to um, that we use that term. And the reason is because it's simply because it's important to call things what they are. Terms like child welfare system, child protection, foster care, those are terms that have been given to us by the state, by the government, for the purpose into tricking us into thinking there's something that we're not. But when we really think about what the system does, the functions of the system are to surveil people, to regulate their behaviors, and to punish them. Those are the functions of policing. So family policing system describes the actual work and nature of the system better. Um, and it's not the first time that different terms have been used. People use the term family regulation for system for, for a while. I learned about family policing system from um, a doctoral student that I was working with, Victoria Copeland. I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with Victoria and her work. The term family policing system in the modern usage of it comes from Victoria and um, Brianna Harvey, who were both doctoral students at UCLA um, doing work related to the child welfare system and using the term family regulation system and had a conversation about how it's really more than regulation, how it is about family policing. Um, and then Dorothy Roberts subsequently used that term. Both Brianna and Victoria were doctoral students working with Dorothy. She was on their dissertation committees. Um, and Victoria or Dorothy started using that term and torn apart and it kind of became popularized through that. Um, but the reason we use it is because it's, it's the accurate term. Absolutely, it is, which is one of the reasons why so many states are now pushing for Miranda rights for families, because when you speak about policing, we need to make sure that people understand what their rights are when they're being investigated and interrogated by this agency. So in your book, you also talk about the separations of families that occurred during the Trump administration, the zero tolerance policy, they called it. Mm -hmm. How does that policy intersect with what's happening in communities across the country? And why is it important to understand the connection between the two? And why do you think that there was an uproar about those children being separated from their parents, but not the families within the United States? 
Yeah, just like it's important to make the connection between the separations that were done during slavery and the separations that are done today, it's really important to make this connection between the separations that happened during the zero tolerance policy. <clears throat> One, because it's recent, but two, because of that outrage that happened, there were groups of physicians across the country saying that family separation is tantamount to torture during zero tolerance. There was a petition signed by over 7,000 mental health professionals saying that to pretend that separated children don't grow up with the shrapnel of this traumatic experience embedded in their minds is to disregard everything we know about this topic. And even there's a pediatrics professor at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Charles Nelson, who said there's so much research on this that if people paid attention at all to the science, they would never do this, talking about family separations. So just a few years ago, we had psychiatrists, pediatric professors, doctors from across the country saying that separating children from their parents is torture. The family separations that were done during zero tolerance policy was about 3,000. The family policing system forcibly separates over 3,000 children from their parents every week in the United States. And that is torture, just in the same way that it was during zero tolerance. What it tells us, though, is that there is a disconnect in our public consciousness. And that disconnect happens because the family policing system has been masterful in creating what we call a myth of benevolence. Many people think that the separations done by the family policing system are necessary, they're done to help children, they're done to save vulnerable children. None of that is true. We know that more than 70% of children in foster care are in foster care because of what the state calls neglect, which is largely related to poverty. But many people don't know that. And that's in part what my book, what the work that you do, what many of us are trying to do, because we should be thinking of them in the exact same way, because the harm, the trauma that we all watched on TV during zero tolerance when children were being separated from their mothers, that's happening every day across the street in our neighborhoods to children and families all around us. And if we were upset then, we should be just as upset and if not more upset that that's been happening for 60 years to black families in this country. Alan, you mentioned that you believe the family policing system gets away with this because they have been masterful, I guess, in the way that they have marketed themselves. I would like to ask you, do you think it's because they've been masterful? And I'm asking this question because in the last recent years, of course, advocates have has really raised this issue um, higher than it's ever been lifted before. People are beginning to talk about this issue of family policing as much as they're talking about mass incarceration at this time. Mm -hmm. With that being said, the outcomes are there for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because they're masterful at selling the idea that they're saving children? Or is it because people are turning a blind eye to what's happening to black and brown families? Yeah, that's such a good point. And, and I think the answer is it's partly both. I mean, the system does do a very good, good job of maintaining this narrative that they're saving, protecting children. The media is also very complicit in that, in terms of spreading the image, until recently, until the last few years, spreading this image that they're a benevolent helping system. But, you know, as, as, as Dorothy Roberts said over 20 years ago in Shattered Bonds, the reason there's not this kind of, the same kind of outright, out, outrage is because it these family separations aren't happening to the same children across the board. These are mostly happening to black children and brown children, and the general public just simply doesn't care about that and turns a blind eye to it. So the blind eye is a big part of it. Absolutely. I, I think I really credit the advocates, not just those of us with lived experience, but those of us like yourself who support the movement that's being built and being led by parents and children who have been impacted by the system. Because it's just like with the um, criminal justice system and mass incarceration, people weren't paying attention to that even though they knew what was happening until people with lived ex experience began to speak out and take prominent roles in leading 
um, the understanding and fighting back and saying, we're not gonna tolerate these conditions. It started with the conditions and now they're looking to abolish prisons as well. Um, because it's not about making a bad thing better. It's about getting rid of things that don't work. Absolutely. So in your introduction, in addition to setting up the history of family separations in the United States, you write, the issue of intent is an important premise of the book. What did you mean by that? Yeah, that the idea of intent is really kind of the foundational piece of the book. In fact, the title of the book initially was called Racist Intents. Um, it got changed later on. Um, but it was because when I was originally thinking about like, the idea for this book, it was I was thinking about the war on drugs and what we know now about the war on drugs that people were tricked into thinking back in the 60s when it was created by the Nixon administration and then the 80s when it was kind of expanded under the Reagan administration. Now we know, today we know, that the war on drugs was a huge con, had nothing to do with drugs, but was specifically for the purpose of locking up Black people because the Nixon administration was threatened by that. I actually wrote down this quote because I wanted to read it because I don't know that everyone's familiar with it. This is from John Ehrlichman, who was a White House counsel to President Nixon, who said just about like six or seven years ago, he said, you want to know what the war on drugs was really about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 had two enemies, the anti-war left and Black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and criminalizing both, we could disrupt their communities, we could arrest their leaders, we could raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And that's what I wanted my book to show, that when we talk about the outcomes, the harm, the oppression that's caused to Black families by the family policing system, that's not an accident. Those are the intents of the system from the very beginning, going back to the earliest iterations of the system that started right after abolition of slavery with the orphan train movements, Children's Aid Society, the intent of the system, all the policies that were developed were for the purpose of maintaining the oppression of black people and maintaining the supremacy and power of white people. And my book clearly lays that out. And it's not just a argument I'm making. There are facts that back this up with the policies. This was the design of the system from the very beginning. So when people talk about unintended consequences, there's no such thing, not in the system. I think white people are the unintended consequences. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't mean to get them too, right? <laughs> but some just kind of fell into that. Yeah, um, that's, a point. that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because when you talk about the intent, this raises real issues with me in understanding that these were elected officials, these were politicians. And when I push really hard in New York for Miranda rights for families, rights that families already have, constitutional rights, government officials not entering homes without court orders, um, search and seizure laws, and all of these things that are violated daily in our community, thousands of times a day. I'm really frustrated with our elected officials. I see elected officials as the people who are supposed to protect the people who are elected to protect the people from government overreach and misbehavior and prevent them from working outside the framework of the constitution, right? Any laws that's written should be within the framework of the um, constitution. And so my disappointment, what this raises to me is my disappointment in politicians. Maybe I shouldn't be so disappointed because it was politicians who put this in place and who understood the consequences that were intended and not unintended. So, how, I mean, how would you suggest I process that information knowing that it was the same people we elected that setting us up for this failure? And is that why we're seeing such little movement in changing and getting rid of the parts of the system that are not working. Yeah, it's that's such an 
it, it's such a difficult conversation and a difficult thing to process. But I, I think it is, it's the reality is that elected officials are not going to save us. Elected officials don't care about us. They don't care about impacted families. They care about the people who are paying for their campaigns. You are who your funders are. And we know who's funding our elected officials. That's what they care about. And that's where their real interests lie. So they'll make overtures and they'll make gestures. Um, but at the end of the day, they're invested in, politicians are invested in the status quo, in maintaining the status quo, in maintaining the systems that we have of capitalism and oppression that depend on some people being oppressed and some people being in power. So that's that's not the route to save us. So as you guys can see, my cat has shown up and he's whispering some stuff in my ear about Black Cats Matter too. And there's a history of saying they're bad luck and he's thanking me for adopting him. And so I just want to mention to you guys that yes, Black Cats Matter too. <laughs> All right, so Alan, in chapter three, you really get into the idea of racist intent. When you talk about the history of CAPTA specifically, one of the main points you make is that what some people have described as unintended consequences of CAPTA that has disproportionately harmed Black families and is actually the clearly foreseeable and directly intended consequences of um, CAPTA. How did you come to that conclusion? I know you just touched on it a little bit, but I want people to understand how what you said is related to CAPTA and what part of CAPTA brings this all together. Yeah, CAPTA is the perfect example or the most clear example, I'd say, of what I mean when I say an intentional consequence or a racist intent. And I'll give a little bit of history. I'll go quickly through it. But you know, before the 1960s, there was no such thing as mandatory reporting laws. Very few people even paid attention or knew about this idea of child abuse. Beginning in the early 1960s, um, a doctor named C. Henry Kemp wrote an article called The Battered Child Syndrome that got a lot of attention in news media and fanfare. And it was about very serious, very serious chronic physical abuse of young children. That led to kind of a child abuse scare across the country, led to a rapid rise in state mandatory reporting laws. So in 1962, before most mandatory reporting laws were established, only 662 cases of child abuse were reported nationally to law enforcement. By 1968, when all 50 states had a mandatory reporting law, that number went up from 662 to 11,000. 11,000 reports because of mandatory reporting. And the impact on Black children was immediate. 45 in 1968, when all 50 states had a mandatory reporting law, over 45% of hotline calls were on black children, even though black children were only about 8% of the population at that time. So this pattern of over-reporting black children was already starting. And we also saw that what was originally intended to supposed to be just about severe physical abuse had become this much wider umbrella about poverty. And so then we get to the early 1970s when conversations about CAPTA began. Every politician involved in passing CAPTA had all of that data, knew that if CAPTA were to pass, if they were to federalize that or establish it at the federal level, if they were to add permanently add neglect as a category of maltreatment, they knew that that would severely disproportionately impact Black people. And they were fine with that. They passed it anyways. That's what I mean by it's not being an unintended consequence. If if you're a legislator involved in passing CAPTA, you know that the passage of CAPTA is going to result in severe harm, disproportionate harm to black children and families. And then you do it anyways, when those consequences then become reality, that's not unintended. It was known from the very beginning. So CAPTA is the perfect example. It wasn't unintended at all. Everybody knew exactly what was gonna happen when CAPTA passed. Right. And someone, I believe it was Angela Burton, shared a, a memo with me that she had obtained that was written by Walter Mondale, who was the vice president, I believe, to Jimmy Carter, that laid this out in the letter. It explained, if we did this thing, 
people of color, black people, I, I forgot how he referred to us, um, but he said, will experience over-reporting and over-surveillance. And they did it anyway. And he wasn't the only one who suggested that they not move forward with this thing in CAPTA. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I don't know, Alan. Um, the more I learn, the more disappointed I am. And the more I begin to think about where can my passport take me to live forever outside of the United States. Some mm -hmm. people may find the chapter on reforms to be somewhat controversial. I think the book itself is controversial, right? Based yeah. on how people respond to um, our demand for change. Yeah. But when we talk about reforms in the book being con controversial, I'm specifically talking about, about the part where you say reforms will never work because they are designed to fail. You also say the entire idea of reforms are racist. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that you would say they're designed to fail because there's a whole team of people who've been reforming for decades and getting the same results, but still upset and claiming the work that you're doing is so controversial. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think this is a really important point to understand if you're like new new to the work and new to the whole art idea of reform versus abolition, or still think that reforms are possible. And I want to give credit here to Maya Pendleton, who co-wrote this chapter with me. And a lot of these ideas come from her. She's brilliant. She wrote a couple chapters with me in the book. Um, but the idea is that reforms are designed to fool the public and legislators into thinking that the system is doing something to bring about change, to make things better for black and brown people, even when they know it's not going to. You have officials all the way up to Asia Schomburg who will say that there are problems in the system, we need to do reforms. They've been saying that for decades and then they trot out some new reform and then the public and legislature say, oh, they're responding, they're doing this reform. And then you know, a couple of years later, we look back and we realize nothing happened. And it's because reforms are never going to be successful because they're asking the system to do something that it literally can't do. Reforms want the system to perform family policing and forcible family separations in ways that are a little bit less racist and a little bit less harmful. That's just simply not possible. The problem with reforms isn't that we need a family well-being system, or we don't have a diverse enough workforce, or we need like better assessment tools. The problem with the family policing system is that it was built for the purpose of harming Black children and families, and it does that exceptionally well. So reforms are never going to change that. And reforms are also racist, inherently racist, because reforms maintain the idea that Black families need to be surveilled and separated, just a little bit less. So any reform that still keeps a system of surveillance and separation intact is racist at the core. So Alan, you keep bringing up these things for me. So <laughs> it feels like they're weaponizing harm reduction against this because reform is through their lens, I believe, to be some type of harm reduction. We're, we're not looking to slow the bleeding down. We're looking to stop the bleeding, right? And that would be to abolish, to get rid of. And I say to people who get afraid by the terminology um, abolished by that wording specifically to slow their role because if something's not good, why would you want to hold on to it? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to continue trying to figure out how to fix it when you could just get rid of it and make it right? And right. making it right may mean not replacing it with anything, or it may mean replacing it with something that actually does what they claim that system was intended to do from the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So related to reforms, you talk about some current reforms happening at the national level that give the impression that we all want the same thing. And we know that's not true, right? And one of these national efforts, thriving families, safer children, this is all government bullcrap, says they're working to transform child welfare 
into a child and family well-being system. But you're very critical of efforts like this. And you're right. If we allow the reformers to succeed with their plans for transformation, and the family policing system is indeed reimagined into a system that looks different, but where family separations still occur, we will look back and stand aghast, just as Frederick Douglass did upon visiting the South 20 years after the abolition of slavery. As we realize nothing has changed, family separations continue. Black Americans remain oppressed, Racism continues to flourish, and the white child saviors who led the efforts for transformation sit back and marvel at everything they've accomplished. I wish you guys could give him a round of applause for this. You said a lot here. Let's talk. Thanks, Trace. Yeah, thriving families safer children is one of the biggest cons that the government is trying to put on all of us now. And it's because it's meant to fool us. It's, it's meant to trick us. It's a huge national reform. They call it transformation, but it does not involve at all ending family separations. So any transformation, whatever you call it, that doesn't completely eliminate the use of family separations is still going to end up with a racist, harmful system. No matter what strategy you come up with, if you're still separating Black families you're, and you're still doing that disproportionately, your strategy is racist. Casey Family Programs is a racist organization because they fundamentally believe that Black children need to be separated from their families, and they support that practice. And that's what I mean in talking about Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, 20 years after the abolition of slavery, went to the South and looked at the how Black Americans, freed Black Americans, were, were faring. And he realized that 20 years later, they were no better off. And that was never the goal of the original abolition movement. The goal of the abolition movement wasn't just to end slavery. It was liberation of Black people. It was so that Black Americans were, one, no longer enslaved, but also had the social, economic, political capital to truly be equal members of society. And when Frederick Douglass went to the South in the 1880s, he said that the formerly enslaved were victims of a cunningly devised swindle. And although they were nominally free, they were actually still a slave. So Frederick Douglass actually denounced the whole abolition movement and called it a stupendous fraud because nothing had changed. And that's why it's important for all of us to be vigilant. Don't believe anything the Casey Family Programs or the Children's Bureau says. That's they're lying to you. They want to keep the exact system in place. They just want to put fancy words around it. And that's what I mean. But if we believe them, if we say, oh, Casey Family Programs, they're doing this great thing. They're doing transformation. And we just let them do what they want to do. 20 years from now, Black children and families will still be disproportionately separated and surveilled. Their oppression will be intact. All of the white people that run these systems will be doing great. And they'll be proud of themselves for all this reformist work that they've done, but nothing will be different. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess before we, we have a lot of time left, but one of the things I want to make sure we talk about tonight, so please remind me, is the talk that MJ did at NACC this past weekend, um, which is really interesting about white people doing this work in our community and laying out laws and all of the other things that they put their hands in where, where they just simply do not belong. So Alan, you are also very critical of the Children's Bureau, as am I, their new focus on racial equity. Um, I heard, I'm also critical of, of Governor Hochul here in New York, who was talking about equity and marijuana a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, screw you lady. Can we get equity in child welfare, equity in housing, equity in the school system and equity in all these other places? You talk about equity and marijuana. What the hell does that even mean? Why is that a priority for you? Keep them high and they'll never realize that we're fucking the hell out of them. You know, like, come on. So you criticize the Children's Bureau's new focus on racial equity. And to some people watching who might be familiar with what the system calls racial disproportionately, 
um, or the overrepresentation of black children in the system, they might think that achieving racial equity is a good thing and that we should all be striving for. Why do you say that racial equity is not what we should be working toward? Yeah, again, you'll you'll see you'll see a theme here. The whole idea of achieving racial equity, which is the system's focus, is designed to trick us um, because it sounds good. Who wouldn't want to achieve racial equity, right? That's what we should be striving for. And in fact, like when if you think about it logically, if racial disproportionality is the problem, meaning the overrepresentation of black children, if that's the problem, then the solution is proportional representation or racial equity. But what does that actually mean? If the system achieves racial equity, that still means that hundreds of thousands of black children are separated from their families. All children are forcibly separated. They're just separated proportionally by race. And when we think about how harmful this system is, if family separations are tantamount to torture, the way that 7,700 psychologists said a few years ago, that means that we're just equitably distributing harm. So equitable harm is still harm. There are some things we want equity in. Equity in housing, absolutely. Equitable harm inflicted by the family policing system isn't something that we should be striving for. So it's a horrible goal, but it sounds good and people buy it. Politicians buy it. Oh, Asia Schomburg, I just heard her talking about racial equity. That's their number one goal. They're doing a great job. They're not. They're just, it's like what prison abolitionists say. Nicer, friendlier cages are still cages. You can't dress the system up and reduce harm a little bit. It's it's not good enough. Absolutely. And interesting enough, Asia Schomburg just recently asked me, she's, she's made a statement first. She said, as a federal um institution, they cannot support publicly any of my legislation. But what else is it that she may be able to help me with under the idea that she wants to partner with me? There's no government agency that wants to partner with me and do right by family. So we know that's not going to happen, right? But the thing my response was, instead of telling her what else she could do, I simply said, if you cannot help me as a federal organization, ensure that my constitutional rights are upheld, then there's nothing you can do for me, right? That's equivalent to me being in a supermarket, doors shut, you own the supermarket, and I say, Alan, I'm hungry. And you say, I can't allow you to eat any of this food, but maybe if you tell me some other things you need, like housing or shoes, I might be able to help you with that. It just doesn't make sense. Ridiculous. It doesn't make sense that the Children's Bureau is saying they cannot weigh in on the fact that an agency that works under their umbrella is not being put in a position where they have to abide by people's constitutional rights, where they have to recognize and not redline and not have the support of fake ass politicians to redline communities out of being able to exercise their constitutional rights. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm not gonna go on a tangent though because this is your day, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Alan. Toward the end of the book, you acknowledge some of the critiques of our work, specifically those who say things like abolition is not supported by evidence and abolition will only result in children being harmed. But you say it's abolitionists who care most about children's safety. How do you, what do you mean by that? How, how can you make that make sense to people? Yeah, so so there there are critics of the work that we do. And similar to calling things what they are, we should just call them what they are. They're the white saviors. They're a group of white saviors who are, most of them call themselves researchers. Um, and they're very critical of the work they do. First, with the issue of evidence, the evidence of the harm caused by the family policing system is vast and stark. I, I can't go through all of the evidence, but all of the evidence is, is in the book. The book is, was intended to lay out the evidence. Again, going back to the evidence of 7,700 psychologists saying that family separations are tantamount to torture. That should be all the evidence you need to say that we need to stop doing that. Um, so the evidence argument is ridiculous. But what they really focus on is tricking people into thinking that if we're successful in abolishing the system, that that will just lead to more children being harmed. And they're only against abolition because they really care about safety. But that's ridiculous. 
we are the ones who are trying to protect children from the harm inflicted by the family policing system, harm that these white saviors are apparently okay with. We know that rates of abuse are two to three times higher in foster care than they are in the general public. We want that to stop. The white saviors are apparently okay with that. They're apparently okay with children as young as three being drugged here in Texas if their behaviors, if they get, if they act out a little too much. They're okay with children being beaten and raped by their foster parents. We're not okay with that. We want that harm to end. And that's what I think people misunderstand about abolition sometimes. Abolitionists want all children to be safe and thriving in their homes and communities. That's what we're working for. We want a society where the idea of forcibly separating children from their parents would never come into existence because the idea is so repellent. Um, we want children to be safe, and that means protecting them from the harm inflicted by family policing and family separation. Absolutely. So when you talk about white saviors, you already rushed me to that part where I talk about MJ at the conference last weekend. And MJ was asking what qualifies you to work in my community? Mm -hmm. What gives you the authority to tell people in my community that you don't know or understand, don't want to know or understand, who you don't believe have a right to anything, not even feelings, to tell us what's best for our children. Right. And that to me is the bookend to what I'm always saying about these white saviors. You keep, they come into our community and talk about our generational harm. Well, who fucking caused it? Mm -hmm. And why do you think we're harmed by the things you did but you're not harmed by the things you did generationally. Mm -hmm. Your children watch Black people hang from trees, be burnt, be beat, and the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. They participated in sexual acts. There was times when white people killed the nanny that had raised their child because their child had become too close to that nanny. Do they not think that there's generational harm, psychological harm in white people experiencing that? The fact that they run around saying that they're superior tells me there's a mental illness that they need to heal from because what makes you superior? Mm -hmm. They codify each other's nonsense by saying things like, oh, she was acting out of her privilege. It's white supremacy. It's not white supremacy. It's white arrogance. And I ask everyone on this call, when we start talking about changing narratives and calling it what it is, call it what it is. It's not supreme. That's not supreme behavior. That's not good behavior. That's not any of the things that they try to associate it to be. It's arrogance and it's disillusion. And you need to go work on yourself and leave us alone. Absolutely. It's it's white arrogance is the perfect way to say it. There's we have this group of white alleged researchers who have made it their life's mission to try to tell us and tell all of the families who've been harmed by the system that racism simply doesn't exist in this system, that it's not a problem without any concern for the harm that that causes the black and brown people who have directly experienced it. And they could care less. They keep writing their papers, they keep doing it, and they could care less. And like you said, they need to look at themselves and their motives, because that's where the real problem is coming from. Absolutely. So, Alan, your book's last chapter focused specifically on abolition, which you call a radical involving movement towards limit liberation. In this chapter, you talk about the limitations of the white imagination. And specifically, that is the white imagination that prevents us from understanding what abolition could truly look like. You write, the white imagination constrains our ability to imagine what is possible, because in many ways, what is possible is beyond what we have the capacity to imagine. Explain to us what you mean by this. 
Yeah, the concept of the white imagination, I think, is important um, in, in this book. And uh, again, this chapter was written with um, Kristen Weber and Maya Pend Pendleton happened with these ideas. It's the idea that we all of us, regardless of our own race, we all live in the white imagination because we all have been socialized to exist in this society that was created by white people for the benefit of white people. White people created the systems that exist today for the purpose of maintaining their supremacy. And though, so those systems to maintain their supremacy, the systems are designed to maintain inequality. So in the white imagination, abolition of systems of punishment is unfathomable because punishment to them is both appropriate and necessary to maintain the status quo, this, this world imagination. Yes, I mean the colonizers. Um, but speaking to the limits of the imagination, it's it also impacts our ability to think about the solutions to our problems because of the limits of the white imagination. So when we're confronted with a problem, we think of solutions that we know to be possible. So like think about poverty. When Even if we're able to think of like what some people think are radical solutions, universal basic income, living wages, guaranteed child allowances. When we think about like, if the problem we face is that people don't have enough money, then we can imagine strategies that provide people with more money. But we don't ask ourselves, why do we live in a society where people are required to have money in order to live? Maya Pendleton, who wrote this chapter with me, once said, and I'll, I always remember this, and it was a big spark for this, said, why is it always build wealth and never abolish capitalism? That's the limitations of the white imagination. If the problem is people don't have enough money, the solution isn't give them more money. The solution is why do people need to have money in order to eat and live? That's what we should be challenging. I would say I 100% agree with you on that. So I'm gonna move into the question and answer period because we have just a few more minutes left. Um, separations occurred during the Obama administration as well. No, with a question mark. Don't answer it, Alan. I can assure you a white person asked that. And we're not going to answer that because pointing out that the black president did it too will get you no brownie points. Alan, can you speak to how, let's see. Now we're not going to answer everyone I'm reading, but I'm going through them right now. We're going to figure out what is worth responding to. Alan, can you speak to how the terms disproportionality and disparity are used as ling linguistic trickery to distract from the fact that Black children, parents, and communities are targeted by the system? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all a trick. All of the language that the system comes up with, it's, it's a trick to fool us. Disproportionality and disparity are passive sounding words. It sounds like the racism or, or the racist Dis the disparities just kind of happen you know, when in fact it's inflicted on black children and families. Racial disproportionality doesn't just happen, but it sounds like it does. It sounds like this passive act when in fact the racism that exists in the family policing system is a very active form of racism that's inflicted on black children and families. I don't use the word disproportionality and disparities. I use the word racist inequities because I think that's a little bit more active. I don't know that that's the best word still, but I think we need to be always looking for words that better capture the active nature of the racism and harm that's inflicted on people. So we have a jackal in peoples who keeps talking about the best interest of the child. I'm gonna answer that. The best interest of the child is for them to remain at home intact with their family um, because most problems that children are removed for are problems that we can rectify, but we make no effort. In fact, we incentivize the separation of the family by strengthening outside resources um, to be able to take that child into their environment. It is not in the best interest of a child to torture them, as we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. So if there is any ways possible to keep the child home, and there's always possibility and hope to do whatever it is we see as important to do, to be done. And so the best interest of the child is to leave them at home with their families and provide them whatever supports they may need if we deem they are lacking certain necessities. And so... I hope I've answered your question there. And that was a very simple one. Um, as 
Esmeralda is a doctoral student at UTA whose focus is policing, race, and immigration. Do you believe that social work as a racist colonial policing field can ever be truly abolitionist or liberationist? Or like others, police, family policing, immigration, not to be truly reformed? Yeah, that's such a good question, and and one I I struggle with a lot. Um, I think that the current state of social work and the way that social work is currently practiced is not something that can ever be abolitionist or liberationist. Um, social work is so deeply embedded in carceral systems and committed to ignoring the harm that it as a profession is complicit in, that they cannot see any way out of that. So the current state of social work is horrifying because of the harm that it's responsible for. It's also what I hope that people start to see largely performative in the same way that things like the Children's Bureau are and things like that. Social work's code of ethics says that social workers must take action against oppression, racism, discrimination, and inequities. Yet social work is responsible for causing racism, oppression, discrimination, and inequities by their work in police, with, with the police, in prisons, with immigration detention, with the child welfare system. And they have absolutely no intention of getting out of those systems. So in its current form, I absolutely don't think that social work can be abolitionist, but that's why I think there need to be more of us who are calling on social work to be something drastically different than it is right now. Um, because I don't think we can keep, it, it can't keep doing what it's doing right now or it'll work itself into just irrelevance, which I think it's kind of quickly on the way already. Okay, so I'm going to skip to a question by Michael Rainey. Hi, Michael. Um, have you had a chance to read Jane Spinnick's new book? And what are your thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. The End of Family Court. Yeah, I think that Jane is brilliant. I've read about halfway through the book right now because Jane and I and Kelly Fong are giving um, a presentation later in October. And actually, um, yeah, we're giving a presentation in October together about our new books. And, you know, the family court is a big part of the same problem. Um, judges in family courts rubber stamp all of the decisions um, that family policing agents make. Um, and it creates, it. it's part, the family court and judges are a huge part of the problem. So absolutely, I support what she, what she writes about in that book. Kate Harris asks, who are the people or organizations that we can connect with who are organizing around abolishing the family policing system? Well, I would say let's start with JMAC for Families, just making a change for families, and up in where Alan hails from. And Alan, do you want to throw in any other organizations that's doing this work? Yeah, I think you know that that's a good that's a good place to start. It's upinmovement.org, your JMAC for families.org. Um, you know, there's other organizations that are doing similar work. Movement for Family Power is one that has been doing this work and collaborating with us for, uh, with you, Joyce, for a long time. Um, so yeah, there are there are organizations doing some good work. I, I think those are the ones to start with, and then you'll get connected to others. Operation Stop CPS is doing great work. MJ's MJ's group. What's is the MJ Coalition? I'm sorry, MJ. What's I believe it's MJ Coalition. Mm -hmm. Um, MJ is in Colorado. Um, Operation Stop CPS is Amanda Wallace, and she's in North Carolina. And Movement for Family Power is um, Lisa Sangoy and Aaron Cloud. Mm -hmm. And I and believe it's yeah. MJCF Coalition. Yes. So those are places where you can start for that. And here we you're going to have to get down, sir as we wrap this up. So we are now about to come to a close. So let's take just one more question. Where is the site of true liberation from family policing? I'm, I'm not sure I understand that one. Um, you know, true, true liberation from family policing 
is only going to come when family policing no longer exists. Um, and I think that, that's what the work of abolition is about. Um, ab the work of abolition is about belief that another world is possible, another liberated world is possible, because the idea that liberation is impossible is not something that we can that we can believe. It's not something that we can we can support. Um, and I think the reason why people like Joyce and me and many of the others who are I know are watching this, the reason why we do the work that we do is because we know that it's possible because we see the work being done, not just in this country, but in other countries working towards abolition. So we know that that works possible. So real liberation comes when systems of harm, systems like family policing, prisons, policing no longer exist. And we have the power to end those systems. So this is our very last question. And then I'm gonna give the quick close out. And this is a really important question. And I'm really smiling to be able to ask Alan this question. This is the crown jewel. Is there a parallel between being demoted from Dean, the firing of Angela Burton, and the hit that the Administration for Children's Services put on my job at um, when they got me terminated? under then commissioner David Hansel. Is your demotion and our firing related? And if yes, how? Absolutely, they're related. And it goes back to the white saviors. The white saviors, the people who right now, whose careers are dependent on this system continuing, all of the so-called researchers who churn out paper after paper extolling the benefits of foster care, all of the people running Title IV-E programs around the country that are forcing poor black and brown students to go to work for the system in exchange for an education. And in a bigger picture, all of the white people who control the government and depend on our oppression to keep their power intact, all of those people are scared to death because they know that we're winning. And because they're scared, they're lashing out. They're doing everything in their power to stop us. And that's what white rage is. There are times when white rage throughout our society has been impacted on with direct violence. And there's times when white rage is implemented in other more subversive ways, like demoting me as Dean, the hit put out on you by David Hansel, Angela Burton's firing. The white people, the white saviors are scared to death because they know that we're winning. But it also shows that how little they understand about us and the movement, because what I've come to understand after being demoted as Dean is that power has nothing to do with a position or a title. Power comes from us and the reasons why we're doing this work in the collective body of us who are working for a truly liberated society. We hold the power to bring about the change we want to see. And our power is much greater than those who are trying to oppress us. Absolutely. With that, I want to say thank you, Alan, for joining us tonight here at JMAC for Families on this webinar, um, for allowing us to be the first organization to help and support you promoting your book, for all of the radical and honest answers you gave to us tonight, and for your message that clearly came across that abolition is fundamentally about hope. We hold out hope that we can rid ourselves of a system that does nothing more than destroy families and communities. One that feeds on the suffering of others after they set us up to suffer. We will make change we will not flip for dollars. We will only flip for change and we will make that change. And for everyone who stands with us, just continue to stay strong and know that you will be challenged. I was challenged, I kept my head up and I moved forward. Angela's being challenged right now, she's gonna move forward. Alan also experienced that same challenge because they want us to fear, but I don't live in fear. I live to do what's right. My experience has brought me to a cause that I never knew anything about. And now that I know, I cannot unknow it and I will not compromise my integrity 
to keep someone else happy. I will not be quiet. I will not be silenced. I will continue to work for a rich. I will work to make change. I hope you guys join me. Have a wonderful night, everyone.